paper tonight. If you didn't, uh, the brothers there, you give you one. There's one for the outline, so you can kind of follow along with our study. And then there's your homework sheet. What would Jesus say to our church, St. Mary's First Baptist? As I said several times, what we're going to do with those is uh, we're going to take all of them at the end of our study of the seven churches, and we're going to see what God's been saying to us during this time of uh, studying the seven churches. John, are you, are you recording tonight's service? Yes. All right. I know several people that said that because of the choir sharing uh, tonight that they weren't going to be able to be here, and they were hoping that we would record it. So I'm glad you're doing that. Revelation chapter 2, and we're going to be in verse 18. And tonight we're looking at the fourth church, Thyatira. Thyatira. The messages to the seven churches call on our attention to the different influences or the different spirits, if you will, that the church must be aware of if we are to be overcomers. Mm -hmm. We are looking at the seven churches to look at the seven spirits that we must be willing to confront in every church. And so tonight uh, we're going to look at the church of Thyatira, as I said. We've already looked at the church of Ephesus, and the emphasis there was overcoming what? It was known as the church of what? Loveless. Loveless. Mm -hmm. So it's confronting coldness. Mm -hmm. The spirit of coldness in the church. Uh, instead of it being cold, we would hope that a church would be warm and welcoming and accepting of those who come into the body. The second church we looked at was the church at Smyrna. And there we had to overcome the spirit of persecution. The spirit of persecution. So the first one was the spirit of coldness. This was the spirit of persecution. The third church, which we looked at, was Pergamos. Mm -hmm. And there we had to overcome the spirit of compromise. Absolutely, Linda. The spirit of compromise. And tonight, this church, a five time, is overcoming the spirit of Jezebel. <laughs> the spirit of Jezebel. Or better known as corruption. Corruption. So that's what we're looking at tonight. And the first thing we notice in our study, well, let's read the scripture first. We're beginning, by the way, this is the longest letter of the seven letters. Jesus had more to say to this church than he did the other six. And I think you'll see why when we look at it. So let's stand for just a moment. And uh, you follow with me as I begin reading in the Revelation, in chapter 2 and verse 18. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and his feet like fine brass. I know your works, your love, your service, your faith, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. And then he says, Nevertheless, mm -hmm. I have a few things against you, because you allow that woman, Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants, to commit sexual immorality, and eat things sacrificed to idols. And I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her into a sick bed, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of their deeds. I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and the hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your works. Now to you I say, and to the rest in thy time, as many as do not have this doctrine, who have not known the depths of Satan, as they say, I will put on you no other burden, but hold fast what you have till I come. And he who overcomes 
and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron, and they shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessels. As I also have received from my Father, and I will give him the morning star, and he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. May God bless the reading and now the teaching of his word. Please be seated. The corrupt church, or the church with the spirit of Jezebel. The first thing that we notice is the picture that was real. The picture that was real. There's a lot of different portraits, if you will, of Jesus Christ. Some of them show Jesus as compassionate and sympathetic. Some of them I've seen uh, actually depict Christ in a way that I, I don't believe that it is truthful to Christ. I don't believe they read the Word of God because it doesn't seem to reflect what the Bible says about Christ. But for us to know what Jesus looks like, we only need to do is to search the Scriptures, and specifically here in the Revelation. In chapter 1, we have a, a description of Christ. Look with me, if you will, for just a moment. In chapter 12, excuse, chapter 1, verses 12. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the seven golden lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet, and girded about the chest with a golden band. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine grass, as he refined in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. So in the Revelation chapter 1, we have a description of Jesus Christ, how he appeared to John as he was on the island of Patmos, and he was in the Spirit, and he was called up to heaven. And each of these letters, as he introduces Jesus, has a different characteristic that he focuses on. And the thing that he focuses on here in the letter to Thyatira is what? What did he say about Jesus here in verse 18? Who has what? Eyes, eyes, right? Like a flame of fire. So the first thing we notice is the fierceness of his eyes. The fierceness of his eyes. Have you ever been around someone that they can just look at you and it just kind of, just you just felt like they were looking through you or looking deep into you? They just had those kind of eyes. Some of you may remember your mother looking at you at an occasion <laughs> like that. Or maybe your dad when you were growing up. All they had to do is look at you and maybe say your name. And you knew that that was not a good thing. Well, Jesus is talking about here his fierceness of eyes. Or you see, he sees everything. There's nothing that escapes Jesus. And he sees it all. And he talks about the fierceness of his eyes. Penetrating eyes. He sees into our deepest thoughts. Now there's a thought. He sees into our deepest thoughts. There's not a thought that you have that escapes him. He sees into our mind and our heart. But not only does he have penetrating eyes, but he has convicting eyes. Convicting eyes. Just like I mentioned your parents, very likely, had those same type of eyes on occasions when you did something that you knew you shouldn't have done, or you said something that you, as soon as you got it out of your mouth, you knew you shouldn't have said, and your mom or your dad looked at you. Jesus had those type of eyes. And he's describing himself this way to this congregation, this particular congregation. I thought about his eyes, and I thought about the conviction in his eyes. And I tried to remember if there was a time in the Word of God when his eyes brought conviction to someone. 
Do you know who I'm thinking about? When did Jesus look at someone and they became very convicted about what he had said earlier to them? Turn to Luke 22. Luke 22. You're going to recognize it right off as soon as you see it. Luke 22. And look at verse 60. But Peter. <laughs> but Peter said, Man, I do not know what you're saying. And immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed, and the Lord turned and what? Looked at Peter. He turned and looked at Peter. And then Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said to him, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And so Peter went out and wept bitterly. Amen? Those convicting eyes certainly penetrated Peter. And so we see the picture that was revealed, the fierceness of his eyes, penetrating eyes, and convicting eyes. But there's a second description of Jesus. Not only does he describe his eyes, what else does he describe in verse 18? What? His feet. What was his feet like? Brass. Brass. And what's the significance of that? He said that earlier too, over in the first chapter. You notice that in verse 15, he says his feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace. What's the significance of that? Remember now, the revelation is written in what? Signs, right? Signs. And so what's the significance of this? Fine brass. His feet were like fine brass that had been fired in a furnace. That's something to do with perfection. To some degree, but the thing he's really focusing on is his judgment. His judgment. Okay. His judgment. There's a passage of scripture that I want us to look at. It's in chapter 19 of the Revelation. Chapter 19 in verse number 15. Revelation 19, 15. Now, let me just set the scene for you on this. Chapter 19, beginning really in verse 11, is the return of Christ at the end of the tribulation. I guess maybe I need to go back even further. Let me just kind of lay out for you very quickly, very succinctly, what I believe the scripture teaches will be the events of the last day. The first event on the prophetic calendar, in my study, in my estimation, my, my perspective, is the rapture. Amen. When the church is called up. And then immediately after the church is called up, begins seven years of tribulation on the earth. And at the end of that tribulation, Christ is coming back. You see, Jesus' return that he promised he would have is in two phases. First, it's the rapture. The second return of Christ, the second phase of his coming, is the revelation of Christ. Over in chapter 1, it says, every eye will see. Amen. That's not true of the rapture. The rapture, he comes like a thief in the night. Secretly. So as I say, his coming, Jesus' second coming, is in two phases. First, before the tribulation, he catches up the church. At the end of the tribulation, he comes back to do what only he can do. And it's described as the battle of Armageddon. Okay? The battle of Armageddon. So chapter 19 of the Revelation is a description of Jesus coming back at the end of the seven years tribulation and it will initiate the battle of Armageddon. I'm going to read the whole scripture, a whole passage there, just so we can get a feel for it. I'm in Revelation 19, verse 11. Now I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes wars. 
His eyes were like, what is it? A flame of fire. Okay? And on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except him. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen and white and clean, followed him on white horses. I hope y'all like to ride horses. Amen? <laughs> we're coming back with him. He's going to catch us up, but we're coming back with him. And we're going to be on white horses, the Bible says, because we will be a part of that army. And now, verse 15, now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword. And that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the wine presses of the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God. That's the picture of the fierceness of his brass feet. Because it talks about that judgment of God. That Judgment at the Battle of Armageddon that will bring God about. And he's using this to describe his person to the church at five time. That's pretty sobering, isn't it? That church had so gotten away from who they were and what it meant to be a church that he had to promise them that many of those who were in that church would face his fierceness of wrath, would experience the fierceness of his eyes, the fierceness, fierceness of his eyes. And so the picture that was real, A, is the fierceness of his eyes, B, the firmness of his feet, pictured the judgment that would come on that church, and it pictured the judgment to come, which we just read about. But then we also noticed, as we consider this picture that was real, the fullness of his knowledge. That's verse 19. We're back in Revelation 2, verse 19. I know your works, love, service, faith, and your patience. As for your works, the last are more than the first. Even though, even though many had left the truth mm -hmm. and had begun to follow the spirit of Jezebel, there was still a remnant. Amen. There was still a remnant of believers who were faithful, who were still seeking to do what was the right thing, still seeking to be uh, truly God's missionaries and messengers. He knows. He knows our work and our love. He knows your service, your ministry. He knows your faith, your faithfulness. He knows your patience. Jesus knows all these and was to know about that church and about you and me. He knows everything about us, as I said earlier. There's nothing he doesn't know. There's nothing that we can surprise Jesus with. Amen? He knows it all. We can't hide it from him. We can't conceal it. He knows. He knows the, the good. He also knows the ugly, the bad. He knows. Okay. The picture that was real. Now let's consider the problem. The problem that was revealed. The problem that was revealed. And that begins in verse number 20. And we see the source of the perversion. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. The spirit of Jezebel, that woman Jezebel. Would you name your child Jezebel? No. Absolutely not. I wouldn't even name my dog Jezebel. <laughs> that is not a compliment. That is not a compliment. There's two names that I know I've never used. Judas and Jezebel. Now, this probably was not her name. But I'm sure that the 
church at Thyatira knew exactly what Christ was speaking about. He was using the name Jezebel to cause them to reflect on 1 Kings Jezebel. You remember her? She married Ahab. You remember the story? And she was the prophetess, really. And she was a prophetess, though, of Baal, wasn't she? Yeah. She was a prophetess of Baal. And she sought to draw the Israelites into worshiping of Baal. And Elijah, you remember Elijah? Mount Carmel. They built the fire, you remember? And he's, he challenged the, I think it was 500 uh, prophets of Baal. And they danced around, did all their stuff around, and nothing happened. And then, of course, Elijah came his turn, and fire fell, consumed not only the altar, but consumed the water around. You remember the story? So he's, he's referencing back to the Old Testament that Jezebel, and he's saying that the lady or the person, it doesn't have to be a woman, it could be a man, the person who is in your congregation is a Jezebel. What did Jezebel do? Well, Jezebel sought authority, didn't she? She married a king, King Ahab. She had a place of authority, and that's important to know. For it says, you seem to look at the source of the perversion was the spirit of Jezebel, but I want you to see the symptoms of her personality, okay? The symptoms of her personality that's B in your outline. And that's the seat. The seat that she had was in the church. She was a teacher. Hello? Mm -hmm. She was a teacher. She had influence in the church. She was one of the leaders in the church. He says, to teach and seduce. He says, all right, verse 20. He says, Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. Jezebel, it's probably very suddenly, began to move this church away from the worship of God mm -hmm. to the worship of idols. Oh, that would never happen here. That would never happen to our church. We can get so caught up in our traditions that traditions becomes more important than our Savior. Are you listening to me, church? I've seen it happen. I've seen it take hold of a church to grip us to the point that we cannot have the freedom through the Holy Spirit of God to move as God would lead us because we are encased in tradition. Now, tradition in and of itself is not bad or wrong. Only if it becomes a priority before our worship of the King and our efforts to minister in the name of the Lord. Amen? You, you understand what I'm saying? You understand the implications of what can happen. And it doesn't happen suddenly. Right. It happens gradually. It sort of creeps in before we even realize it. it's taken a hold. And so Jezebel, the spirit of Jezebel, whether it be a man or woman, becomes a catalyst to lead us away from the worship of God, mm -hmm. to lead us to the worship of stuff that we do as men. Have you seen that happen? Have you seen that happen? Not necessarily here, but have you seen it happen? Sadly, I have. Sadly, I have. Some years ago, I was asked to go as a pastor to help a church that had just gone through a very difficult time. They had had a pastor who made some bad choices. And he led the church to build this huge worship center and the family life center. Three million dollars. And there were a church at that time of about 250 on a good Sunday, maybe 300. 
they could possibly struggle through and go forward financially. But the church split because when they made the decision, the decision was about 55, 45 to move forward building this huge building. And it absolutely destroyed the congregation. And the people, the people who really wanted this beautiful worship center and this new family life center left and left the people who were there to pay the debt on the building. And when I arrived, they were angry, to say the least. But what had happened? Several key people had led them to believe that this was the direction that God wanted them to go. And they led them into this massive death and absolutely destroyed that church. And if it hadn't been for a sister church that came alongside that congregation and took them as a satellite and assumed the debt burden, the church would have had to close their doors. Because the handful that was left, about half of them, they could not afford to pay a humongous mortgage that was on that property. What's, what's wrong with that, you say? Well, well, that's wonderful. No, it's not. Building the church is not about building buildings. Yeah. Buildings are good. We need them. They're resources. Amen? We have to have buildings. No, we don't have to. We don't know. Let me take that back. We don't have to have buildings. Do we? Yeah. For us to worship God and for us to have church, we don't need a building. But yet sometimes our buildings become so sacred to us that we think we've got to have a building. We've got to have all the things that go with that building. And sometimes that thing that we think is so important to us can become like an anchor around our necks mm -hmm. to do what God's calling us to minister. Amen? Mm -hmm. am, I, am I wrong? No. No. <laughs> so I'm just giving you that example. I mean, there are other ways by which the spirit of Jezebel seeks to lead a church into a way that's going to be detrimental. It's going to cause that body of believers to lose focus on what God has put us here for. And what God has put us here for is to reach people for Christ. Amen. It's clear, isn't it? He said it over and over and over in the Gospels. You got the Great Commission, but every one of the other Gospels, it talks about us going and making disciples. For us, Acts, even in the book of Acts, it says, Go, you shall be my witnesses. Amen. And when we get away from doing that, we've allowed something to distract us from what we're to be and what God's called us to be. It's easy. Because I'll be quite honest with you. For us to be effective evangelists, for us to be effective in reaching people for Christ, it's hard work. Yeah. It takes a really serious commitment. It takes a willingness on our part to do what we have to do to see people come to faith in Jesus Christ. But so many of us sometimes Get complacent about it. I'm guilty. I confess to you. I'm guilty. I am. There have been times when I, I know God arranged the circumstance of the situation where I could present the gospel to somebody, but I was just, I was on a mission somewhere else. I had something else I needed to do. Really, what I needed to do is what God was leading me to do. But I thought I was too busy to do it. I'm just being honest with you. I'm guilty. Maybe I'm the only one. Maybe, maybe you don't have that difficulty, that struggle, but I do. It's hard. It's hard for me to stay on mission, on task. Yeah. 
because there's so many other things, so many other things that want to pull us away. Good things. They're not all bad. Sometimes they're good things. I done chased that rabbit enough. We're going to leave that rabbit. Okay. The symptoms of our personality. The seed is in the church. The spirit of Jezebel, as I said, is to lead the church away from the things of God. And it's mission. It's mission. Anything that I see that is trying to lead us away from that mission, then that is a spirit of Jezebel. Because with the most exciting thing, I, well, let me, let me chase that rap just a little bit more. The most exciting thing that happens in a body of believers is when somebody walks the aisle and gives their life to Jesus. I mean, it's just, it's just awesome. And to be in the delivery room, woo -hoo 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 -hoo. I mean, that is out of sight. When God moves in a person's heart and you're sitting there and you're watching God work, it, oh man, I get glory bumps all over me. I can't hardly stand. It's the most wonderful thing in the world. But yet it's still easy for me mm -hmm. to let other things prevent me. Linda was testifying to me today. Mm -hmm. Just a moment ago. Mm -hmm. Now she wrestled with it. Through God be the glory. It sounded like you won the victory. God won the victory through you. Amen. Amen. All right, number three. I want to move on. I know you didn't think I would. <laughs> number three. The punishment that was required. Hmm. The punishment that was required. Verse 21. And I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality. We have a, a long-suffering God, don't we? Yeah. We really do. And he says that, I'm long-suffering. <laughs> Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to salvation. He gave her a chance. He, even, even though she was uh, detrimental. She was attacking the very heart of the church. Amen. He said, I gave her time, verse 21, to repent of her sexual immorality. And she did not. She did not. And here it comes. Indeed, verse 22, I will cast her into a sick bed. They who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent of their deeds. And then, verse 23, I will kill her children with death. Do you see how serious this can be? God will not continually tolerate sin in the life of the church and in the life of the believer. Do you believe that? He will not continually. Now, the Bible says he's long-suffering. Yes. But there comes a point, there comes a time when the reproach to his kingdom, to his church, is so great that he has to do something to remove the reproach. To remove the reproach. Let's turn, if we can, to John first. First John. And let's look at the fifth chapter. First John chapter 5. I have not thought about going here, but I think we need to just for a few minutes. Verse 16. If anyone sees his brother sinning, a sin which does not lead to death, he will ask, and he will give him life. For those who commit sin, not leading to death, there is sin leading to death. I do not say that you or he should pray about that. Well, the question immediately comes to my mind, what's the sin that leads to death? I think we can have some indication of that if we'll turn to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. And look with me, if you will, to verse 26. Hebrews 10 and 26. For if we sin, I, 
deliberately, my scripture says willfully, if we sin willfully, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation, which will devour the adversaries. Anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or more witnesses. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will, it, will he be the worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counting the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing and insulted the Spirit of grace. For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. And again the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Is that a sober verse? Yeah. If you sin willfully, what does that mean? Right? And you I know just, it's a sin. And they just don't care. And you do it anyway. Yes. And they just don't care. And they do it over mm -hmm. and over and over. And that becomes such a reproach to the body of Christ to the church that it leads to there's no further sacrifice. You know what the scripture said? A sin unto death. I believe we're talking about a physical death. Physical death. There's an example of that in the scriptures. Let's turn there and we can see that. It's in Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians the 5th chapter And let's see, verse number one. Corinthians, first chapter, first Corinthians chapter five, verse one. Paul says it is actually reported that there is a sexual, that there is sexual immorality among you. Such sexual immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles. That a man has his father's wife. And you are puffed up and you have not rather mourned that he who has done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I indeed, as absent in body, but present in spirit, have already judged as though I were present him who has done so, who has so done this deed. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together among my spirit with the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. The scripture is clear for a church. If there is sin that's taking place in the church, and it's willful sin, it's an abomination, then the church has a responsibility to approach that brother or that sister and bring them, hopefully, to a place where they will repent. Amen? It's called church discipline. I know we don't talk about that today in 2019, but it's still in the Bible. Y'all look like a couple of deer in headlights. It's in the Bible. It is frightening. But if we don't follow what the Bible says, then we are allowing ourselves to put, a, put ourselves in a position of the church at five times. You see, he wanted them to address this issue, did he not? He said, you have a prophetess in your midst, and you, she's teaching, and she's leading our congregation astray, and you haven't done anything. Now look, <coughs> we need to face it, and in love, confront it, and seek to restore that person. If they are like she was, not willing to be restored, not willing to repent, then we need to remove them from the membership of the church. Hello? It's been a long time since anything like that happened, hasn't it? I'm glad you brought up where it was located because I've known, I've known of the wording, but I have not found it in the 
find. I know it was there, but I'm just glad tonight you showed me where it's at. Well, and it, it, and it says here that we do that so that number five, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Why? That his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm what I'm, I hope you gather here is that even, even though this person is a believer, and even though they're so, such a reprobate, they allow themselves to go, fall so far away that it's even difficult to recognize them as a believer, they're still a child of God. Amen. Okay? Mm -hmm. And the Lord is saying, this person needs to be disciplined. This person needs to be confronted in love. In love. Over and over again when you go to study the scriptures, it always says, speak the truth in love. Amen? We're not condemning them or judging them. We're hopefully restoring them. We're reaching to them to help them to find the place that they've left in that position in that, uh, in that uh, body of believers. It's a hard message, isn't it? It's a hard message, but it's a worth. It's a truthful message, and it's one that the church needs to hear more. And we need to ex exercise our responsibility to try to reach out to those individuals and to reclaim them, to draw them back into the fellowship. So the punishment that was required, the Lord is patient in his judgment. The Lord is practical in his judgment. Will be an example to the churches. And will be a warning to the churches. And the Lord is perfect in his judgment. Salvation is according to faith. Judgment is according to works. <coughs> My goodness, he didn't stop there. Amen? He's got a word to the remnant. The promise that was reported, verse 26, the promise that was reported. And he who overcomes that remnant and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. Woo! Amen? The Bible tells us that as believers in Jesus Christ, we are going to be seated on thrones. Did you know that? During the millennial reign, it seems to be, that that's when that takes place. We will share in the reign of Christ. Let's look at Revelation 20, verse 4 and 6. Revelation 20, verse 4 and 6. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them, and then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for those, their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his images and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead did not live again. And so but verse 4 specifically talks about believers, believers. And it says that he saw thrones and they sat on them and judgment was committed to them. So we shall share in the reign of Christ. Those who remain faithful and who may remain committed. And the last thing he says in verse 28 about this church, that remnant specifically, he says, I will give him the morning star. What is the morning star? What is Christ going to give to them? The morning star. What could that be? Absolutely, then. It's Jesus himself. You say, well, I, I'm already a believer. I've already got a relationship with Christ. But do you feel like you have all of Christ? Do you think that you understand all that there is of Christ? This is no. No. But you will experience the fullness of Christ, the completeness of Christ. Turn to, oh, here, let's go, let's go there. John 3. 1 John 3, excuse me. 1 John 3. 
Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. Therefore the world does not know us, because it did not know Him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when He is revealed, we shall be like Him, and we shall see Him as He is. Woohoo! Amen? We're going to be like Him. That excites me. That thrills me. I'm not, I'm not liking Christ now. Not completely. I try to live for Christ. I try to let Christ live through me. But I still struggle. You all know you don't, but I do. I still struggle. But when I see Him as He is, I'm going to be like Him. Awesome. Awesome. And so are you, sir. So are you, brother. So are you, man. So are you, sister. We will be like Him. The morning star. So said, well, how do you know that he's the morning? Well, he told us he was the morning star. Back in the Revelation again, chapter 22. Besides that, Linda told us he was the morning star. <laughs> Verse 16, Revelation 22, 16. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the church. I am the root, the offspring of David, the bright and what? Morning star. Morning star. Amen. Amen. Well, I wish there'd been a church full of people here tonight. But there wasn't. But you were. And I pray that God will use it to help you in your, your walk, your pilgrimage with the Lord. Especially as I look around, I see several of our deacons are here. Thank you, man, for being here. I see that several other ladies are here who are leaders in our church. Thank you. And I pray that God will use this as a message that will guide us as a church. That we'll be sure that the bottom line for us as a congregation is to lift up Jesus in everything we do, in everything we commit, and to put sharing Christ with others as the priority of what we do. Amen. Brother Allen, would you dismiss us in prayer, please? Yes, sir. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for bringing us here tonight. Thank you, Lord, for this uh, study and revelation. And, Lord, and just the, uh, the mysteries and the, and the wonderful things, Lord, that you revealed to us, Lord. Lord. And thank you, Lord, for the, the fact, the realization, the absolute truth, Lord, when I die, when we as Christians die, we will be with you in the Lord. And so we'll be with each other as we go out here today. And uh, just help us to be the witnesses, Lord. Uh, help us to let others know, to tell others about um, you, Lord. So that uh, hopefully they can share in what we have and what we know about you. Lord, we love you. Thank you so much for loving us. Thank you so much for sending your son to die on that cross for our sins. In Christ's name, I pray. Amen. Amen. I met with our deacons uh, last month and presented to them the concept, and they agreed to it. And so, beginning in the first of the year, we're going to put a focus on evangelism. But the focus or the message is who's your one? And I'll explain more to you later about who is your one. But that's going to be the emphasis in the new year. And that will go for about five weeks. And then we're going to draw it to a conclusion with a revival. Amen. And we've invited a dynamic preacher to come. Awesome. Awesome. Drum roll. That'd be me. <laughs> <laughs> and Brother Kevin... Uh, who is the minister of music over at Kingsland First Baptist Church has agreed to come and be our music director for those nights of revival. Wow. And he has a heart for souls. So I'm excited about what God's going to be doing. Would you join me in praying for that focus? That God will use it to re revive us as a church body. Yeah. To put evangelism in its proper perspective. 
in the life of St. Mary's First Baptist Church. Would you do that? Thank you. God bless you. Well, if you haven't already, I, the joint choirs did an awesome job last night, and I know they'll do a great job tonight. And you've got 30 minutes to get there. It doesn't start till 7. And so I encourage you to go if you haven't. I'm going to go here for a second time, just to be sure I didn't miss anything the first time. <laughs> and don't forget to bring your homework. Whenever you come back, just get it to me. You don't have to wait until our next study on Revelation, because that probably won't be until the earliest, probably the last Sunday in December. 